head dietitian comes in and slaps a paper down about how intermittent feeding, also referred as carb cycling, used by bodybuilders to get in shape could be something extremely useful and effective for weight loss in overweight people. No shit, Sherlock. Every time we talk about uh, dietitians and nutritionists and uh, all these diet programs, it's always about fixing the problem. Nothing is like this secret weapon you're gonna deploy like a nuclear weapon. It doesn't work that way. Eat a thousand carbs a day with no added fats and then the protein you need, that's actually very difficult. And there's not a lot of people that would be able to do that. Difficult is not impossible. I like that, I like that answer. Difficult is not impossible. On today's episode of MA Podcast with Chris Milos, we're going to finish up our part two of our Q&A. And we had some questions lead into one of the best stories I think I've ever heard Milos talk about. As you guys can see below what questions were asked and kind of try to find out where you want to be in the video to see the answers. But the last question was our favorite memory and of course our favorite meals during bodybuilding and currently now. We're going to do some more of these Q&As to get some more information to you guys. So if you have any questions, please, you can DM me. You could also comment below and please subscribe. But check it out. All right, guys, I'll see you next time yeah. what's up milos what's happening not much i'm actually uh flying to jacksonville uh florida today <laughs> oh yeah what are you flying over there for uh, right for the ufc the oh is, ufc uh, first, nice. uh, not to miss the josh Emmett fight uh i mean it's gonna be crazy so as i have opportunity i, I gotta go you see I, i'm i'm spotting my new t-shirt i got it from dana two days ago i have to brag that's, that's not my awesome favorite. That is awesome, man. That's yeah. great. How many UFC events have you done so far? I, I, I don't think I missed like two of them in the last year. <laughs> I, haven't been to, I haven't been to one. I yeah, have to go yeah. check it out. But yeah. what, what, which venue or place do you think is the best? Florida? You know what? Uh, Madison Square Garden is Madison Square Garden. I mean, I would say this. Abu Dhabi, I was there. They, they make it, you know, oof, next level. But uh, uh, T-Mobile Arena, it's it's coming up on uh, July 8th. Uh, Volkanovski, Rodriguez, that's going to be a huge fight. I mean, the whole card is stacked. Uh, I don't know, you know, uh, Madison Square Garden, for me, because 1998 Olympia, I competed there, you know, so he has this a special value. Oh, I bet. I, I bet you it's changed a lot since then, huh? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Cool. Well, we're here today to finish part two of the questions because you guys out there asked so many questions. So we got uh, we got another six. So we're going to nail those out for you guys. Yep. Um, and obviously, Milos will have his take on there and his experience, and I'll have mine as well. And we'll have a little collaboration on uh, what the question was and how it can be directed, how it can help you guys. All right. So now this is going to be a, probably a multifaceted answer. The best way to bring up stubborn biceps after prioritizing them by giving them their own day. So in other words, he has a specific arm day. And how do you bring up stubborn biceps? Milos? Okay. Just at the podcast on, on uh, Tuesday, uh, Don Lung, who has a crazy biceps, so <laughs> yeah, he was talking and he was suggesting a couple of things for uh, um, Samson Doda, right? Uh, so he's on the 100% belief that the lacking body part should be trained Besides your normal prioritized training, that you put that day for it, you can throw in extra four or five sets every single day. You know, to, uh, throw in, yeah, throw in. I mean, it's it's interesting concept. I did something similar before. It was like called the feeder workout. If I would do the, you know, crazy heavy duty, you know, everything. Next day, I would do like a, a pump kind of training. You know, just to flush the blood again through the same body part. But uh, look, um, Charles Polikin, who you know very well also, he says, you know, to blast the arms, he was uh, suggesting train every day just a little bit, like get that extra pump. So I'm not against it. Uh, you know, the, you do your one prioritized heavy duty training, but arms, especially biceps, it's not like uh, muscle that you need to do heavy compounding moves, you know, go super heavy and all this stuff. As you know, probably you talk to so many guys with crazy arms. Uh, they would go more for that uh, feeling, full range of motion, things that you talk about, uh, elongated uh, um, state, like uh, especially for biceps, 
not too many people are reaching that elongated state. You know, like how they, they always go like partials. They, they don't really uh, go all the way. I think muscle, like a biceps, is especially needed to be uh, worked at that elongated state. So let it drop. Let it stretch you. Uh, but yeah, I'm not against uh, uh, pumping it up. Listen, all this overtraining, overtraining, too much, too much, too much. I, I had a guy in uh, uh, California when I moved into the uh, U.S. He was training every single day, every muscle. It's one of those crazy things, right? Drug-free, looked like a surgeon of Bray. His name was Walker. I mean, I'll never forget this. Like, Every definition of overtraining should be there, right? He should not look like that at all. But he would just go like this, pump, 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 pump. You know, it's like it worked for him. So I did for a while uh, legs because uh, when I came, believe it or not, I have a flamingo legs, 1987. I had like... Uh, <laughs> That's was, so hard to believe. Yeah, uh, you know, seriously. You know, my, my legs were way underdeveloped comparing to my upper body if you can imagine 87 and then once i start you know getting this uh, i had a nautilus equipment oh by the way i just got the arthur jones uh, nautilus manual here somewhere uh you know two days ago I, I ordered nautilus equipment you know how great leg extension leg press uh station they had with the leg extension that go you know uh, on the chains 360 degrees like you can really contract at the top but anyway talking about the biceps they had that uh mike manzer and dorian yates you always see them on the nautilus one arm you know the uh that was fun. but on that one you could stretch completely right and then you can shorten completely i am not against throwing in extra biceps workouts uh, as a, that feeder workout, uh, uh, you know, if it's a lacking body part, connect. I mean, again, I don't know what's your take on it. I am absolutely not buying uh, overtraining ever. You know, we were talking about under eating, under sleeping, you know, maybe, you know, recovery, recovery, recovery. Biceps is small muscle, okay? If you don't do, you don't pound some crazy weight. If you're going to do that once a week, but then the rest of the weeks, go for that crazy pump. And I tell you, I had many of those examples, guys, you know, not really even professional bodybuilders, but guys that want to be in shape. They would pump up every time they go out for the girls, you know, to have the, you know, 21 inch arms. <laughs> and it was like a daily thing. You go out, you can go out without a pump. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to like the thing about this, right, is I think we're this where people people misunderstand that, right? They'll hear every day and they'll try to repeat their hard, heavy arm workout every day. That you can't do. No. Like, you know, but like establishing blood flow in a pump, which doesn't have the same level of tearing as say your primary leg uh, or body part workout would be acceptable. But I think People have trouble drawing the line or what that is. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I agree with you completely. So can you overdo it? Yeah, your body is not designed for that kind of pounding. But for a pump, you know, really, and this is what I always talk, hyperemia advantage system. Increased blood flow to the muscle happens only during a training. Okay, so now you're going to just specifically send it there. Don't go crazy, but go for hyper volumization. Just pump. Your biceps is small. You want to see it bigger, even if it's temporary. Well, how about if it's temporary every single day? Oh, there it is. And you might you might start getting it, you know? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, 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 to, and to finish the question, my thought on that process is, as Milo said, look at how you're doing the movements. How can you improve the movements you're doing? I do believe that most people are trying to train biceps like they train chest too heavy. And when they train too heavy, they're not training the muscle through a full range of motion, um, which is probably causing some, you know, they get the medial epicondylitis, the tendonitis in the elbows here and the inside and outside. So full range of motion, um, making sure your execution's good. Don't train them so heavy. People just do that. Like you don't need to do five reps of a bicep curl, you know, keep the reps a little higher. And then of course, as Milo said, I would agree, maybe start, if you've been doing biceps once per week, Maybe add in one extra day or an or extra two days of like one exercise for three sets to get a pump. 
just to pump it up. Um, and that could be a good way to work off of over time to see how you tolerate it. Um, but the number one thing I always see is limited range of motion, too heavy, um, and they're not getting good quality reps. They're not getting that connection. I've just seen your Instagram, uh, what, yesterday? When you talk about that uh, elongated state and, yeah. uh, and the new research, yeah? That's particularly on the biceps is so prominent, right? I mean, how many times have you seen a preacher crawl and a guy doesn't even go like, uh, you know, 90 degrees, <laughs> you know, they, they, they lower the forearms to the 90 degrees that don't go all the way. Yeah. Well, it's funny you said, because I posted that video on the preacher crew a while ago and all these people were like, no, it's not true. Do, do, do. I'm like, oh my God. You know, what's really funny and, and funny. You just say that Milos. And I love when people who are bodybuilders from way back in the day knew this before studies proved it. So mm -hmm. they're looking at, there's all these new studies coming out about training a muscle in the elongated position versus the short, shortened position versus full range of motion. And particularly one of the two muscles that responded the best in elongated position was hamstrings and biceps, <laughs> right? But the only muscle that seemed not to produce or had mixed results was glutes. Glutes, training glutes in the elongated position but the guy kind of ripped apart the study being like, you, you, you have to look at it multifaceted different movements because it's such a complex muscle that's involved yeah. with so much. Um, but they say squats had one of the most biggest um, engagement in glute activation, yeah. especially when it gets so heavy and you're in that hip hinge. And you go all the way down. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought that you're going to mention the chest because yesterday your Instagram was exactly about the chest lowering and I don't get to. I see this all the time. People don't stretch it. I, I tell them, take that fiber and you want to feel that stretch. Are you, stre are you stretching the chest fiber? If you don't go all the way, you don't. <laughs> well, because they're doing that. They do it mostly for the pressing movement because they're not that strong yeah. and they're trying to lift heavier weight. And that's what keeps them out of that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, do you mind talking about your nutrition background, things you disliked or liked? And I think Milos, you could probably honestly add to this too. So, I'm a registered dietitian. I did my four years bachelor in nutrition dietetics. I did my master's in human nutrition. And then I did my dietetic internship, which is a 1300 hour internship. And you do multiple rotations in different settings, clinical outpatient, um, dialysis clinic, et cetera. Uh, and then you take the exam at the end to be a registered dietitian, which is recognized across the country. Now that's my nutrition background outside of my own personal experience, obviously doing what Milos, you and I, we do coaching help people lose weight over the years. Now, what I liked about it, what I liked about it, it really opened my mind not to be fooled by a lot of studies because my whole entire master's program was about dissecting and ripping apart studies and proving them to be bunk. So I, I'm not duped by headlines. I'm not duped by abstracts. When someone explains something to me, I look at it, read it, and then look into it more versus making a decision based on the headline, which most people do, right? Um, and then of course I had my experience to fall on, but I learned a lot with nutrition, but in regards to my whole entire career path and education, there's not a lot of direct application to what I do now for a living. There's just not a lot of people don't may not want to hear that after spending all that money and time in school. It does allow me to go back in the clinical setting and work in the ICU and hang TPN bags for people who are intubated. Yeah, of course, but it didn't have a super, uh, a lot of application other than deciphering information, learning how to find information, understanding nutrition disease states, because I help type one diabetics all the time. But other than that, that's, that's it. Now, what I disliked, I don't think I disliked much just because I knew I had the experience because sometimes Milo says, you know, when you meet people who are educated, they, they put themselves in a box. They're like, this is not what I learned. This is not what I learned. That's not true. That's not true. When there's a whole arena of experience and anecdotal response that does work. So sometimes it puts people in a box and it doesn't allow them to see other methods and perspectives where they refuse to see it. Kind of like the, the Dunning was the, the Dunning Kruger effect, right? When you know this information, you, you, you think that's, that's all there is when there's so much more out there. Um, but I, I've never fallen into that because I was bodybuilding along the way with my education. I used to get criticized Milos about, carb cycling when I was in bachelor's degree 
They're like carb cycling. What kind of nonsense is that? And I'm like, it makes complete sense and it works. And they like shrugged it off. Like it's ridiculous. And then years later, I'm in my, uh, sitting in the office at the hospital I worked at and the head dietitian comes in and slaps a paper down about how intermittent feeding also referred as carb cycling used by bodybuilders to get in shape could be something extremely useful and effective for weight loss and overweight people. No shit, Sherlock. So you need a fucking study to tell you that it worked. It fucking works. I'm done. Rant, rant over. <laughs> yeah. But, but this is, I, I said this all the time. They would need a double blind university study that water is wet. Hey, yeah. water is wet. You don't need to prove that. But but here, here is what I'm going to tell you. Okay, because every time we talk about uh, dietitians and nutritionists and uh, all these diet programs, it's always about fixing the problem. Okay. Oh, it's obese. It needs to lose weight. You know, high blood pressure, all this metabolic disease. Oh, you know, we need to you know, fix it. Well, why did we uh, get out of uh, the zone that we supposed to be, uh, so bear with me, we're supposed to be going on for the duration of our life. I don't put uh, people on this diet, that diet, 12 week diet, 16 week diet, all this diet, no. I would like to ideally get you on a lifestyle, you know, of taking what you already know you're supposed to be taking. I mean, there's not too many people that don't know, whoa, what is healthy food? What should we be yeah. eating? Yeah, 100%. 100%. You know, it's, oh, you know, let me scratch. Should I, you already know. Now it's just a discipline. And, you know, are you going to, you know, follow through? Because any diet, whatever, keto diet, intermittent fasting, any kind of, uh, you know, whatever, you name it, Mediterranean, uh, you know, the paleo, whatever. It's like, if you're going to do it to a certain uh, period of time. You're gonna, you know, to lose. You're gonna probably shut down your metabolism. You're gonna eat too, uh, too little, and then you're gonna not have a carbs, and then you're gonna start eating carbs, and then boom, you're gonna like carbs too much, and then you again, you're gonna blow up like a like a blow up fish, right? Yeah. Why? It's uh, from this moment on. Okay, if you need some uh, nutritionist like uh, like Chris or some coach like me to really tell you what to eat. And we charge you a lot of money for it. There's no problem because you need to know that uh, you can have a egg whites and chicken and turkey and beef. If, you didn't know that, right? You didn't know that you should have a high quality protein sources, right? And then the carbohydrates that you're going to choose, you know, healthy carbohydrates, you can take at certain kind of times of the day, right? <laughs> and then vegetables, you know, go ahead, kill yourself with it, you know, eat as much as you want and stuff like that, right? You know, so get the idea of, uh, caloric requirement, caloric expenditure, and where you're going to be. And now, if you do need to fix the problem, let's slowly fix it with the, what we were talking in the last episode, little uh, caloric deficit, you know, something that would make sense. And then something like you just mentioned, carb cycling, you're going to go, you know, uh, lower carbs and deficit for a few days, and then you're going to go higher carbs and surfacit, you know, you keep your metabolism going all the techniques that we do anyway. I always say this, bodybuilders are the healthiest people alive as far as following nutritional regimen year round. Okay, with the, you know, uh, some extremes right there, but we eat what we're supposed to be eating. Okay, we eat a little bit more because we go for extreme hypertrophy, muscle mass and all that stuff. But average Joe, anybody that is listening, first, should everybody exercise? Uh, hell yeah. Everybody should be physically active. Okay. You're going to be weight resistance training or some cardio or whatever else, but everybody, especially older you get, more activity you need. Okay. Get your ass in the gym. And then eating. Don't scratch your head. You already know what you're supposed to be eating. You don't need to be on this diet or that diet. Manage your, okay, proteins that you're going to need because protein is the only tissue builder and you need to preserve the tissue because first thing of aging is losing the lean body mass that produce cascade of all these events. Maintain the tissue. You're going to maintain it by exercising and eating high protein. Now, energy nutrients, you can choose carbs and fats, mixture of somebody can, yeah, and time it. You know, this is all that it is. We all know how to eat. 
we just choose to close the eyes and ah, nah, 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 nah. you know th this is the truth yeah i agree i agree this is actually a really good question yeah. and i have some experience in this i i know you have it as well would you program differently for a natural athlete versus a pd or a home replacement athlete when he says program i'm assuming a starting point say for I'm just going to assume, I don't know, but I'm just going to assume and work this way. Would you program training and nutrition different for a natural or for a PED user? Well, you know. I already know the answer, but I, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, for me, okay, I'll, I'll go first. And absolutely not. Absolutely. I, I, I would be like, what do you mean? This is just pharmacological component that you add to the equation of I'm not, I was natural for seven years. I don't know how long you were natural, uh, Chris, uh, when I started from 81 to 87. Oh, two, uh, three, three years. Actually, when I started lifting weights, obviously I started lifting weights very young, um, but actual bodybuilding, probably three or four years. Okay. So I was seven years. And at that time, uh, did I structure it any different? Oh, because you know, I'm not using uh, PEDs. I cannot maybe synthesize as much protein. I cannot maybe, you know, be as intense. I, I cannot recover and all this stuff. Like, what are you talking about? You know, the, the that, this is just icing on a cake. You do exactly the same. And now you just have a pharmacological advantage because you choose so. Agree, agree. So just as he said, um, when I'm planning somebody for a natural guy or non-natural guy, obviously any type of nutrition changes or training changes are going to be based on what they were doing, whether they're natural or not. In other words, if somebody comes to me, uh, two equal people, same height, same weight, same age, same training experience, everything, one's natural, one's not, and they have no recall of nutrition and they have no training program, I don't be like, all right, because you're a PD user, I'm going to give you 20 sets and the natural guy, I'm going to give you 10 sets and the natural guy, I'm going to give you way less protein and the guy who's using gear, I'm gonna give you way more protein. That's not how it works. It's gonna be response over time to how that person's adjusting to what we're changing. And that's it. Now, however, the caveat is if I'm dieting a natural bodybuilder versus a non-natural bodybuilder, I will allocate a lot more time to get the natural bodybuilder in shape than a regular athlete just because their ability to their, their chance of losing lean mass is greater in the natural guy because their testosterone starts to plummet as body fat gets too low. So I'd rather do it slower over a longer period of time. Um, and I don't have as many tools in the toolbox. So with all my natural pros that I diet now and natural bodybuilders, I have quite a few, I do allocate, I could say on average, an extra four weeks of prep. That way I can have a week of like feeding time, but I like them to lose weight slower. They just look better over time. That's yeah, that's really sure. it. For sure, because yeah, now when you look at this pharmacological enhancement, what does it do? You know, it's anti-catabolic. Right. Know, so you have that advantage. That's why I was talking about pharmacological advantage. So therefore, I mean, you need to even be more specific and you know, giving more to the natural athletes because now they don't have this advantage. So as you said, now we're going to give them four weeks of more time and, uh, uh, you know, get them in a lesser deficit so they can maintain more muscle. You know, that's the whole, very, very logical. And yeah, I, I agree with your approach. Uh, it's funny how people will just assume, because usually people ask those questions are ones that haven't used gear before. And what is really funny, Milos, Anytime I know a lot of my friends who were natural, competed as a natural athlete, and I was not natural, they would always hold me on a pedestal in regards to, well, because you use gear, you can do this. Right. As in, they knew they had a pre-perceived notion that gear was making me able to do X, Y, and Z. And then when they used gear for the first time and they started training in bodybuilding, they realized that all those misconceptions in their mind they created were not accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 that, it's the same with growth hormone, right? Someone's like, oh, about to start growth hormone. It's going to be a game changer. I'm like, it's not going to be a fucking game changer. Relax. Yeah, yeah oh, that's right. Everybody thinks that, yeah. Holy shit. Or yeah. insulin, too. They're like, I'm going to use insulin. I'm going to blow the fuck up. I'm like, dude, nothing 
It's just a part of the equation. Nothing is like this secret weapon you're going to deploy like a nuclear weapon. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. See, I'm trying to find him on right now. I'm trying to find him on the uh, internet because he's probably one of the most uh, impressive natural bodybuilders. It's, uh, the question was, the best natural bodybuilder in your professional opinion. Um, I can't think of his name. It was Ronnie Coleman until 95. <laughs> that is true. That is yeah. true. And Kai Green was natural. Didn't he win his pro car like four or five times natural? Yeah, I think Kai Green was until 2005 or 2006. Yeah, and, and you could see when they touched him. I'm going to say this. You probably, okay, you probably don't know that far. Uh, Paul Jean Guillaume, do you know this no. guy? Paul Jean Guillaume, yeah, he competed in the uh, uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. He was training in the uh, gold gym where I was. That's most perfect body you can possibly imagine. Quality. I mean, rip to the bone, striations everywhere, deep separation, tie-ins, pure, crystal clear. I mean, everything like Jesus Christ, right? And uh, uh, this guy, you know, they say, you know, how can you ever vouch for somebody? Do you live with them? Do you see, you know, all this I mean, I've been in the, in the same gym training with, with, with him like for... I don't know, three years, I watch him, he would have a headache and he would refuse to take ibuprofen or aspirin or anything. He is one of those nuts that, you know, uh, unless he's green, uh, runs or swims, you know, so, <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't take it. You know, vegetables, you know, uh, fruits and and, uh, and uh, meats and fish, you know, stuff like that. So for, for me, it was uh, uh, Jean-Paul Guillaume, of Paul Jean Guillaume, Jean Paul Guillaume, uh, Mike Ashley. I mean, uh, again, I know that there is always a, a, a shade of suspicion, right? That, oh, yeah, yeah. What do you mean? But uh, uh, I, I have a tendency to believe people uh, that I know for many years, and uh, the you know insisting. Now, I'm surprised you're not going to say uh, uh, Michael Hearn. Is this the guy that you're looking at? Well, he keeps coming up on all and every single list <laughs> as like the number one best. But like, I, I'm not saying he's not, I'm not saying he is, but I just, for some reason, I just don't put him in the category because unless like, I, when I'm thinking of an actual bodybuilder, I'm thinking about all the people that consistently compete in the WMBF and OCB who get drug tested, who polygraphed all the time. I'm thinking about those guys. Like Jeff Nippard, um, obviously Lane Norton was a great bodybuilder back in the day. But there's one other guy that is outstanding and he is natural and I can't freaking find him. Um, well, but it's funny, some of these natural lists I just found, Milos, yeah. there's some guys on there that I know aren't natural because I know <laughs> them. Of course. I mean, look at me. I'm 99.99995% I'm, uh, <clears throat> natural, you know, so, the, you know... You, in a nutritional uh, information on the label, right? That that can be rounded up to like a hundred percent natural, right? <laughs> yeah. But if you take a hundred milligrams and you are over hundred kilos, right? What is the percentage? That's like a you know hundred thousand part of yourself. So that's right. a, you know. It's a hard question to answer, but the guy I was thinking of is the one know, that was who, on who was on Fuad, uh, Fuad's podcast. That's the guy who I was thinking about, um, but I just can't, I can't find him. A man's physique, classic physique, bodybuilder. He's a bodybuilder. He's a natural bodybuilder. He's retired now, um, but he was outstanding. I have to find him. Let me, let me just find this out. Well, listen, I have a, as you're looking for it, I have a utmost respect for uh, naturals. Yeah. Uh, but I, I question why they're natural because they think like, oh, Steroids are bad because out of fear, a lot of people are because I don't want to be. Well, you want to be enhanced. You ah, found be... him, found it. Uh, what is it? Doug Miller. Hey, you know, I, I don't actually know. <laughs> I, Doug Miller. Jeff Nippert is a great bodybuilder. I know he's natural. He was friends with John Meadows, but Doug Miller is incredible. Okay, I'm going to Google it right now. <clears throat> but so, why do you think natural is a natural? Um, 
you know, I think they have a different philosophy and perspective of looking at it. I really do. You know, like, you know, in racing, there's the stock and modified cars, right? Yeah. You have like the stock division where you can't really do so many alter alterations and okay. modify. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Great bodybuilder. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And like, I don't know why. Uh, maybe they don't have the need to it. They don't have the desire to it, which is uh, each to each their own. I just find it funny sometimes how there's so much animosity uh, from some of the natural guys to the drug guys. Not all. Well, would be animosity. Oh, you know, you guys are bad because you choose to cheat. Am I cheating? Well, that's they say. It's not cheating if everybody's doing the same fucking thing. Of course. But, but not just that. Uh, here's the question for all the naturals. Why are they natural? Because it's so proper. I'm uh, connected to the nature. You're not connected in many other ways as you know it. Okay. Right. But you're a bodybuilder. You don't want to be normal. You want to be so you're enhancing yourself with the natural supplements, right? With the natural foods, with the natural training. You know, you are you're trying to enhance. What's the reason you don't want to enhance any further? If if you will now not have a fear of oh, this is dangerous. How the hell is really dangerous if you know what you're doing and using anabolic constructive metabolism not destructive constructive thing that can make you more constructive it can build more not destroy more right it can make you more of a man right man's hormone testosterone it makes us who we are right so you can have a little bit more of this and uh, synthesize more protein and all this stuff but no because it's dangerous well i said that many times I use it since 87, which makes it about 36 years. I'm yet to find one single negative side effect that I can say, like, oh, my God, you know, I regret taking it. But, you know, me on the side, why they are naturals? You know, really, 90% out of fear that this is not good for you. This is why. Okay. So anyway, uh, if they do some research and they find out and especially they get older and they're 40 plus, so maybe they're going to now consider, oh, now I don't need to be so natural. I, I, I might want to replenish my low testosterone. I might want to, you know, enhance myself now. You know, you you know it's a good story, Milos, is I had a guy named Tony. Um, and uh, he was natural forever, competed forever as a natural. And then he didn't start using gear until he was almost 40. And when he did, his physique changed, everything changed, and he ended up getting his IP Pro card, and he looked nasty uh, at 50 years old. Nasty. Um, and he suffered from low testosterone for many years and competed as a natural bodybuilder, um, but he finally took that route. But uh, it's interesting. But that's a good question for you guys. Listen, if you guys are listening and you are natural, put in the comment section why... why you guys are natural. You know what? I'm going to put that question on Instagram and we're going to answer that at the end of the next podcast when Mil Milos and I get on here and we get our next guest, which your next guest is probably going to be Mr. Jose Raymond talking hey. this morning. All right. Next hey, question. Please. The abuse of carbs over a balanced diet as in more healthy fats I, and benefits of having a good variety of foods in the diet. Oh my gosh. Okay. Eating an insanely high carbohydrate diet and lower percent of calories from fat versus having a balanced diet, what's the benefit? Well, when you say insane amount of carbohydrates, that that already means uh, uh, more than you're supposed to. More. Well, than I th I think I think what he means is, in other words, like say if you, ten percent of your calories is coming from fat and the rest is protein and carbs versus being like a 20, 30, 50. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, but but again, you know, I have never been about percentages. I've been about nutrients that I'm taking in a specific period of time. So this is how, I, if you ask me what is my percentage, you know, I wouldn't know. All these journals that I keep showing you guys, I was training twice a day, okay? And as a twice a day, I would need the, so much carbs. And as I eat so much carbs, I was not allowed so much fats, right? right. So for me... For me, that made perfect sense for me. Six days a week, twice a day workouts. I was on very low uh, fats, but not insane amount of carbs. I was eating appropriate amount of carbs needed 
for my you know caloric expenditure and then for that extra muscle contraction for a reload of glycogen and all this stuff so jay cutler would be you know pretty much the same way right uh carbs and protein is main and very low fats now when you start bringing those healthy fats and say of course you have to reduce your carbs and now you know you, that's probably something that you're doing chris now you have a higher percentage of uh, uh fats maybe meals that your body doesn't need carbohydrate energy you don't take carbs and this is what i do with many of my clients i give them carbs when they need the carbs if carb is not needed for immediately you know muscle contractions and reload of glycogen the rest of the day you can be on uh, healthy fats and, and and proteins so if i'm understanding the question of the guy why would i recommend carb and uh, uh, fat are fuels carb is preferable fuel for muscle so i'm using this fuel when i know that muscle is going to be activated burning the calories needing the glucose for contractions and reload the glycogen if i don't have a workout i don't need carbs fat is you know probably safer you know but you, you don't trigger the insulin release you don't trigger insulin this glycemic response and maybe inhibit the fat burning and all that stuff so at, at that uh, time fat would be preferable source but uh if you're active constantly twice a day I would I would much rather you eat higher carbs and very low fat than uh, than mixture twice a day workouts you know a prescription for me would be high carbs no fat once a day workout carbs around the workout before and after maybe one meal before two two meals after and uh other three meals could be with no no fat no carbs with fats yeah um and, and my answer on that is would be coming back with so many questions like who's this for right i mean a general population person who's maintaining their diet i would want them to be balanced to the point where they can sustain what they're eating meaning if they really love fat sources I'm sure not going to give them a low fat diet because it won't be sustainable for them. But for the purpose of what we're doing, um, I tend to, same with you, Milos, I, I venture more on the lower fat side to save more of those calories from carbohydrates because higher thermal effect, you need them as energy. They're less likely to turn to fat as fat would be able to turn to fat. Um, obviously, we need to have some essential fats in the diet. So it's not like we're going to zero. Um, and then in rare instances, I will use fat to bring calories up if I need somewhere to bring calories in that's palatable for that individual. And that's kind of my stance on it. I mean, there's very rare instances, I don't know of any, where somebody becomes fatty acid deficient, eating too low a fat of diet provided calories are, are, at, uh, calories are adequate. So it's like if your calories are adequate and you're in a calorie surplus, um, and your fat percent's pretty low, and everything's functioning fine, then there's no real issue there. If if you're legitimately bottoming out your fat grams and you somehow manage to eat five, 10 grams of fat a day, that's a problem. But I mean, clinically, Milos, in the hospital, um, many disease states require an extended low-fat diet, which is, in the hospital, it's 40 grams of protein per day or less. And that's that's very low, in consideration for most people and they live on that indefinitely so it's 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 a it's a very individual question i mean yeah. there's situations but, where i'm not going to put somebody on so many carbohydrates who are not bodybuilders but i mean we're talking hey, about bodybuilding I, here so I, I forgot that you you're actually dealing with the normal people too <laughs> yeah i, I thought this question just uh, for uh, athletes bodybuilders you know the the competitors so you know, I didn't even look at aspect of the general population, popular, right? The, Which is a whole nother. It's a yeah, whole nother answer, different. you know. <laughs> but now you mentioned something, and I want to get the, that education uh, from you. You guys study the novel lipogenesis, DNL, right? Yeah. And this, this is the thing that uh, uh, it was open eyes uh, eyes for me from some uh, clinical nutritionist. Uh, okay, the novel lipogenesis conversion of carbohydrates into the fat so he asked me just point blank do you think it's sufficient I said what do you mean you know and that was like 
ninety five six you know back in the day and says so okay you know uh what do you mean is efficient so he asked are humans as a species efficient in converting carbohydrates into the fats so silica so guess well excess carbohydrates why not I mean uh, you know you know you would assume then he and he right away would point out all these studies you see Charles Polykin would be the guy that he remembers the exact study who did it which year which university all that I don't remember anything you know it's too much info I have a small hard drive let me just get the point so point was that humans contrary to species like avian species birds and stuff like that they don't have a efficient conversion of carbs to fat and the way I, I remember the he says maybe 10 percent of total amount of carbohydrates could be converted no more like hold on a second you take a thousand grams of carbs and uh only 100 grams of carbs you know could possibly convert into the fat and he says yeah I said oh, you know I you know I, I don't believe that so I came out of this um we, we we went to the seminars it was uh I forget the the, the name of the doc but uh, there was clinical nutrition and the whole study was about because uh ketogenic diet no carbs no carbs were popular in a day so he had a that presentation about the carbs carbs don't make you fat okay carbs with fat make you fat so he, he goes like okay if uh you just go on zero fat diet okay kill yourself with the carbs and lean protein and see what happens so that was very interesting for me like okay you know what uh I can use this with, with some of the guys you're falling asleep Chris <laughs> 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 nice talking to you <laughs> so I tested it I started giving the people like uh protein source would be just egg whites uh you know lean white fish and uh, protein powder and give them like a thousand grams of carbs so I would do carb cycling that you would do I would do actually five days of uh, keto diet and I would do the two days of super high carbs and I give them kill yourself with the carbs with it okay and nobody you know I get any fat like oh hold on a second so I start exploring a little bit more so right now because I know a lot of people are going to answer on this de novo lipogenesis studies they can maybe you know post and link it and all that stuff uh it's theory that humans don't convert excess carbs easily into the fat what happened is if you trigger the insulin release due to the carbs okay and you have a, a triglycerides lingering around as insulin is not selective and there is a glucose there's amino acids but it's also triglycerides this is you know uh how the carbs are gonna uh consequently make you fat not carb directly converting it to fat but carb uh triggering insulin release insulin in the blood finding the triglyceride but if and storing it but if it's no triglycerides around okay then uh, this doesn't happen so again I'm not uh Michigan you know, University or or uh you know that's interesting that's that's very interesting that so you'd have to go you'd have to go to almost a zero fat diet almost yeah almost zero fat. yeah this this is exactly so if there is no fat lingering around kill yourself with the carbs and this is coming from this study like you know what I would never really test it but that uh uh here it is presenter PhD professor in the university I forgot the name of it I was there with the Charles Parkin for like three days and uh, that was that that's something that really triggered uh me thinking De novo lipogenesis the statement was humans are not species that have efficient DNA conversion of carbs into the fat and as I remember you know quite well this is about 10 percent is a maximum amount that could be converted so okay that that uh, I'll take that easily right so now uh if you don't abuse the carbs okay crazy even if you abuse it 10 percent. so if you take a thousand grams of carbs that's 100 grams that's 400 calories okay that's if you really abuse it but if you have a zero fat and that day 
which uh, I encourage you to try with some people and whoever is listening. That's you know, interesting. Like, I mean, it's funny. It's like, that's actually really hard to do. It is. Like, eat a thousand carbs a day with no added fats and then the protein you need, that's actually very difficult. And there's not a lot of people that would be able to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Difficult is not impossible. I did it. Oh, for sure. I did it. I like that. I like that answer. Difficult is not impossible. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Milo's got to put that on a fucking t-shirt. That's good. That's good. That's my, my, my saying, I, I read that somewhere. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. In, in closing the whole question there, like I, I do believe that in, in a bodybuilding standpoint, a lower fat diet um, is warranted. Uh, I know Dave would freak out on that, you know, because Dave loves fats and lower carbohydrates, a totally different approach. But, you know, I found that out myself as well with, you know, I, my fats are around 50 grams a day. Um, I keep my fats lower and my carbs are much, much, much higher. And um, I'm, I've been able to stay much leaner all around. And uh, I, I feel fine. I don't have any issues with anything. I mean, and I, I kind of adjusted to it. I do love fats. I love whole eggs. I love bison. You know, I love macadamia nuts, but I just don't have an abundance of them, you know? Yeah. But yeah. that's very I, interesting. I have them when I... When I, I crave fats, I have fats. When I crave carbs, I have carbs. But I, you know, as I said earlier, you know, we all know what we're supposed to be eating. So we're supposed to be eating a certain amount of protein and a certain amount of energy. If energy that we need at this time is not carbohydrate dependent because we're going to train, you can have fats. Oh, I love fats. Like I said, I like uh, whole eggs, macadamia. I like uh, whatever, salmon, uh, steak. You know, that's the time to eat them. Okay, and then later on, when you really want the carbs, well, you cannot have a carbs and fat and protein, so reduce your fat and your you know carb meal of the choice. We got two questions left and about seven minutes to answer them, so we'll answer this one quick. How yeah. long should prep be for your first show? The length of the prep for your first show depends on how much body fat you need to lose. Yeah, yeah. That's just plain and simple, <laughs> um, and that's a catch twenty two right there, man. And this is how I say it. Preps on average could be anywhere from 12 to 18 weeks. If you need more than 18 weeks of prep, you should not be doing a show. You should be getting into an acceptable level of body fat and then entering a prep in a reasonable timeline. I just don't think people should be prepping for 24 plus weeks to get all this body fat off because the body's eventually going to metabolically adapt and become more resistant. It's not going to work the same. So that's my answer right there. Yeah, but you can always go bowling if you're so fat, you know. So yeah. everything goes down to uh, that thing. You're a bodybuilder, 36, 365 uh, days a year. Once you get uh, ready for the show, don't let yourself get out of the show, you know, so this kind of shape. So you're going to need 12-week diet or you're going to need the less than 12 weeks diet or just cruise into it. You know, if you go for this crazy off season, eat whatever, get big, eat big, whatever, then you can go overboard. And uh, like you said, if you need more than 18 weeks, you're not uh, meant to compete. Correct. Um, this is a good closing question. All right. When we were competing, what was your favorite meal then? And what's your favorite meal at the moment? Best contest memory or favorite bodybuilding memory? You want to go first? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My favorite meal, the last meal that I remember being my favorite when I was competing was salmon and white rice. I loved that fucking meal so much. I look forward to it every day. And then if I had to do a close second place, I loved my whole eggs, my two whole eggs for breakfast, my Ezekiel toast, and my egg whites. I love egg whites. I love egg whites. Every I, I've eaten egg whites and whole eggs every day for breakfast for the last 20 years. I love eggs. So probably eggs. Favorite meal at the moment? Fucking eggs. <laughs> and I like New York strip the meals. I've been getting into uh, reverse searing New York strip, Put cook New York strip on a low, low temperature, pull it out pan sear it to make a crust and then base it in a little bit of butter with uh thyme and uh rosemary that would good. be my other favorite meal best contest memory obviously for me it's easy when i turned 
when I earned my IP Pro professional status at nationals because I never even thought I would become a pro. I never thought it was a reality. I was just taking one step at a time, doing one show after the next after I won that one. Okay, let's do that one. I won that one. Let's do that one. But I never thought it'd be a reality. And I honestly didn't even think that I won. I thought I got second. And when they announced it, they said the runner up is. And then, oh, no, they said the winner is because usually they say the runner up and then, then you know who won. And they just said who the winner is. So I walked out there to collect. I walked out <laughs> thinking I got second. And the guy next to me goes, congratulations. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, dude, you won. And I'm like, oh, what? And so like that was one of the best memory. That's the yeah. best memory for me of all time. It's but uh, I would love to know your best memory, Milos. I, I tell you. The, is this like one more thing that you're supposed to answer? Yeah, the your favorite meal when you were competing and your favorite meal now. Yeah, okay. So I'm just like you. I don't know if you've seen. I have on my uh, YouTube uh, same breakfast for 40 years. I still, I can't wait to wake up. So we have my two whole eggs with the egg whites, okay? Uh, I do put some mozzarella cheese in it, right? I do to, oh, yeah. to make a little bit, very little. Then I have a Greek yogurt, you know, uh, non-fat. <laughs> uh, I, I have a, a, a bread of some kind. So Ezekiel bread sometimes. I was eating Vogel bread. Vogel, V-O-G-E-L. That was from... Uh, uh, Miss Olympia 91, they, they, they had the like boot at the show and, and it was mixed grain bread. I, I loved it. I would, I would have like uh, four pieces uh, of toast every single day, forever and ever, all the way to the contest. Uh, that didn't change. And now I, I add a little bit of uh, uh, dry uh, beef or, uh, or like brazola from, from Italy. This is every, I cannot wait to wake up in the morning. I have this for 40 years. Just like I said, if I travel some, somewhere and I can't have that breakfast, I'm all screwed up the whole day. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm the same way. I yeah. love my breakfast. When I come back, I'm always like, man, I yeah. miss my breakfast. Yeah. Is, is this the bread? B-O-G. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, th this is it. But uh used to have a, a little bit different uh, uh uh, package. It was red, but it has to be the same. So mixed grains. I loved it. Uh, you know, and phew, uh, I, I had it all the way to the show. That, that was my choice of carbs in the morning. You know, always. You you like salmon and and rice? My favorite was always steak and rice. I mean, steak and rice would be, you know, the. I, I can feel it since. Uh, uh, I start bodybuilding. I, I, I prepare my mind like this. If I see fat, it was very hard for me to imagine that that fat is going to be for sure burnt and used and not stored. So I would never have a ever, especially like saturated fats, like fatty meats or anything like this. There's no way I would put this in my mouth, right? Because but steak, it looks like a muscle, right? I could identify that uh, uh, steak, you know, going into my muscle tissue immediately. So steak and rice, it's uh, the best building meal of the day, off season, on season, doesn't matter. Or right now when I'm not competing, steak and rice, serve me at any point, you know, I, I would love it. Sirloin, sirloin or flank steak? Okay. Uh, I, would, I would have a, for me, London broil, Ah, because, because it was the leanest, it was like uh four percent fat, but uh, I, I used to it, and it would be like uh, you know, over easy, not over easy, uh, uh I mean, uh, uh, rare or medium rare, you know, this, this is how I was doing it. Later, I, I switched to flank and then fillet, you know, uh, I could convince myself as long as I don't see how much fat is in fillet, but you know, I just look at the texture. I could convince myself I'm not getting fat. Yeah. You know, <laughs> back, back in the day, I didn't have a m money to buy a fillet. I was, I was, London Braille was the by far the cheapest one and leanest one. You know, so yeah. Back in the day, it was two ninety nine for me. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was like no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, memory, it's similar. Okay, I, I, I I'm gonna tell you, 
my first international contest. I'm going to test uh, waters. There was in Italy. It was um, okay. European Championship. And uh, first of all, right, uh, I don't have the money to get there. So it was like uh, <laughs> trains, bus, automobiles, that movie, you remember? I, I went there, you know, uh, I went to Bari, uh, to Bar first. It was in Montenegro on the coast. And then I was taking a boat to Bari, Italy. You know, so it's like, you know, uh, from, from uh, uh, Yugoslavia back in the day to Italy on the boat of course the cheapest ticket uh, on top you know just to get there don't speak english don't speak italian right i go there european first time with the european bodybuilders and all these monsters were coming like big old guys and i'm just like so intimidated like oh my god are they gonna just smoke me like this is gonna be embarrassing right so now it was crossing my mind of like you know what Nobody even know that I'm here. I better not compete, you know, because this is going to be like, like slam slam dunk killing. You know, I'm, they're going to tell me, please leave the stage, right? This is what I was thinking, you know, when you're insecure, you you see anybody bigger than you is like, oh my god, I had zero chance, zero chance. But I'm already there now. I was thinking, you know what? Nobody knows I'm here, so nobody's going to know that I I, <laughs> I was being embarrassed here. So okay, let me compete here. I step on the stage, right? So now they're announcing in Italian language. They don't even say double biceps, you know, duplicity, you know, shit. And I, I don't even know. I've never been to international contest. So I'm just there looking whatever else is doing. I'm doing the same thing, right? So I pose whatever everybody else is, you know, posing. And then I start, you know, uh, getting cheers for me. And then I end up just with some Italian guy, right? And I'm in Italy, you know, last call outs, right? So it's obviously for the first and second, but I had no clue that this is for first and second. You know, this is my first international contest. I have no idea, okay? So anyway, you know, so I guess, you know, at least I had some stage time. So I guess it's not completely uh, worthless. You know, I had no clue that I was, top two so i end up placing second okay audience went berserk for me you know <laughs> i don't know i was 23 years old maybe good looking you know a serbian with the kind of classic body right but, but uh, not, not too muscular but i guess italians would like that so now they're pronouncing right the winners and then there was a the prize money so at that time I got the second place in 300,000 lira. For me, this is like fortune. It would be equivalent to getting a hundred grand now, right? No you shit. Know? I mean, it was like, you know, of course I don't speak any, any, anything, right? And then this uh, guy, uh, president of federation, there was WBF in, uh, uh, in Europe, right? So he came to me and he tried to talk, but I don't understand English. I don't understand nothing. So there was a, a, some a Yugoslavian, Croatian guy there. They came and um, you know translated. So the guy said, congratulations, you deserve to win, but you understand this is Italy and they're not gonna give it to you because first place was 3 million lira, right? But he goes, I wanna uh, extend the invitation for a Mr. Universe contest in Arizona. Okay. So Mr. Universe in Arizona. So like, what I mean? So he wrote official uh, invitation for me to compete in that contest, which I brought back to Yugoslavia, went to the embassy and they, uh, they grant me a visa, which it was impossible in 1987 to get visa to the United States, you know, forget about it. But with this, you know, I got it. So to make a long story short, my my best uh, bodybuilding experience was going to that show. I hardly made it, right? Uh, then I get the second place. I get the money. And I get the invitation to come to America, which, uh, you know, uh, got me there. And on the way back, I met these two American girls <laughs> who, by the way, uh, were both uh, seasick. So they were throwing a puking, 
you know, and, and I'm there, you know, trying to be a gentleman. Like, okay, me, you know, can I help you? <laughs> you know, so anyway, I got hooked up with them, and that's how I came to San Diego uh, a few months later, and here I am. And Milos, so that is actually a story I've never heard before, and that was an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, honest to God truth, you know. So, like, so, you know, sometimes bodybuilders go there. And they don't know what they're worth. So similarly, I, I know that we, we got to go. But uh, my first pro contest, I went to San Jose Pro Invitational just so maybe I can stand next to somebody. And uh, my friend is going to take a picture so I can send a picture back to Yugoslavia. Like, oh, I was here with uh, Albert Backless or with uh, John Brown or, with, you know, somebody. This is it. But I was being called for a, a first call out, you know, that... They didn't call Milo Sharchev, they called something else. So I'm not responding, not responding. I'm there. So finally, Wayne Demilia, who was calling like for a fourth or fifth time, competitor number two. Like, oh shit, that was me. So I won symmetry round in my first pro show. And I placed third, which qualified me for Mr. Olympia. So that, that was similar feeling, right? Also prize money, Olympia invitation. And then next day, uh, three cover shots for uh flex muscular development and uh, muscle mag so that you know, is an amazing fucking story yeah i had a few of those you know that made me happy that's a that's a good story i got one of my clients downstairs he's getting ready for his yeah. pro debut in the open um yeah. for the uh show in texas i'm gonna tell him that story that's a yeah. fucking great yeah. story that's yeah. a great story all right man Listen, all right Milos. yeah at least I kept you awake because in the middle of my DNL conversation, you fell asleep. <laughs> Dude, Milos, Milos, I don't know what my problem is. Like, I'm I'm not even tired. And like lately I've been having like these like these like micro turnoffs where like maybe I'm 40. I don't know what's going on. Like I'll be sitting there with, like the other day I was talking to my wife. Hey, and she's like don't, don't 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 cut out. Don't cut out. Like, Are you sleeping? <laughs> and I go, I don't think I was sleeping. She goes, Oh no. Hey. You put your head down like this, and I'm like, I don't remember. <laughs> don't cut out, you know, keep it there because it's funny. I'm getting like narcolepsy over here, I was like blacking out randomly. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, anyway. Milos, have a good trip, man. And then, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll hit you up Monday. What time do you come back? Yeah, Sunday night. Sunday yeah, so, night. I'll hit yeah. you up Monday for next week. We'll schedule something. <laughs>